Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. frame rate in 48 frames per second but we weren't sure that you would have enough of it to get immersed so it's just 24 frames per second i'm tom merritt i'm brian brushwood and i refuse i'm gonna stick to my 15 frames per second it's all 1995 up in this business i've only got 620 scan lines myself i'm so old uh you know what i used to remember was it 320 by 240 is that 200 scan line interleave voodoo one 3d fx card what I got nothing. Throw it. How you doing, hey, Tom? Oh, by the way, episode 85, for those of you keeping track, welcome to Frame Rate, the show that helps the folks who want to watch the video how and where they want it, whether it's on the internet, on the television screen, or using the internet to watch it on their television screen. We are the show for you. Yeah. So yeah. if you got any questions, you just better listen up because we're about to tell them to you in the big story. We are taking it on. Big story. A small story. This just in, the big story. We open with a tale of two reactions. On the one hand, DirecTV and Viacom in a battle over channel fees. On the other hand, Dish versus AMC and their affiliated networks in a battle over channel fees. But oh, two different reactions. Uh, both have ended up with channels being dropped from the service. In DirecTV's case, however, Viacom reacted by taking down all of their videos streaming on the internet from everyone. Because, you okay, know, so a DirecTV clearly- user might be trying to stream it, and we can't really tell, so we're just going to block current episodes of The Daily Show, a bunch of MTV stuff, a bunch of Nickelodeon stuff, from the entire world. So what you're saying, Tom, is in a face-off between a content provider and a cable provider, it is advantageous to the content provider to make sure that nobody can see the content because that's their bargaining chip. And that means like they don't want to they don't want to they don't want to let anybody see it if they if they have or oh, was a direct TV. Yeah. You got to shut it down, shut it down for everyone. Don't make it available online. So clearly you're in a position of power because you hold the content. Right. Except. You are blocking it for people who don't have DirecTV, and Hulu was able to show Daily Show and Colbert Report because they have a separate agreement with Viacom, and Viacom couldn't pull the shows from Hulu. Okay, 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 but 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 this is this is a singular case where it's like they they had an idea and it didn't quite work, but clearly this is the right call for content providers. Oh, to, I, I to see, I see where you're going with this, stuff. right? Because the Dish AMC battle continues, and obviously the way AMC reacted, similar to Viacom, AMC went in the chat room during Breaking Bad and said, "Hey, here's where you can watch Breaking Bad online. Here's where you can buy it from iTunes. Here's where you can find our show other places. You don't have to have Dish." This is amazing to me because you have essentially a, a highly similar dispute between uh, between content providers and cable providers, and you have entirely different attitudes about what is the right way to outmaneuver the competition. And in this case, AMC says, screw it, let's make it available to everyone, which, by the way, I have to eat crow because I, I – on this show, I believe, said there's no way this dispute will continue through the premiere of Breaking Bad. But I didn't consider the fact that they're able to avoid being the bad guy at all by making Breaking Bad available with the premiere to live stream to anyone. It was Dish in this case, right? Uh, by making it available to Dish subscribers online, they AMC comes out smelling like roses. They get, they get to sit there and say, hey, bro, we want you to watch Breaking Bad. We want you to watch all our fine programming here on AMC. For some reason, the man over here is trying to screw you over. So here's a little bit of, let me give you a little bit of the URL. Except they're so not they're doing anything. All they're doing is telling you where their stuff already was. 
Well, no, 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 no. But uh, they are doing that. But but you remember they made Breaking Bad. That's the real story is that they made Breaking Bad premiere available to uh, two dish subscribers that I believe it was like amc.com slash dish subscribers or Breaking Bad Dish or something like that. Yeah, but they had a specific URL just for just so that they could work around the fact. It, and it's a, it's less about that and more about the the reaction, in my opinion. In other words, AMC's reaction was, well, if we're going to get eyeballs, we need to get eyeballs. So here you go. Let's find other ways to get these dish subscribers to watch our stuff because that will put pressure on dish. And Viacom said, aha, they're going to try to get around this ban, and it won't be as bad for DirecTV people, so let's make it as bad as possible. Now, you're right about the perception, right? As soon as Viacom did this, a bunch of people on Twitter uh, I saw started condemning Viacom. And, sure. and, and obviously, you're, you're right that AMC comes off looking like the good guy. But, the, but frankly, the whole thing, they're, bo they're all bad guys. In my opinion, <laughs> they, they are absolutely all That's, bad. All this, this is a, a, a dispute over a couple of dollars per subscriber, right? right. Dish wants to pay $2.43 per subscriber. I don't know what the exact numbers are. I'm just making these up. Actually, I think the sure. DirecTV numbers are pretty close to this. DirecTV wants to pay $2.40 some cents per subscriber for Viacom channels. Viacom wants them to pay $2.83. It, and, and yeah, multiplied over the total number of subscribers, that can be a billion dollars. Uh, that Viacom's trying to get, but it's all about being able to continue to either save or get more money. It has right, nothing but, to do with but, anyone being good or bad. And, okay, and uh, what's yeah, but, what you're seeing online are different negotiating tactics for the digital distribution rights. I read a, a piece today that said DirecTV may uh, be willing to agree to a higher rate than otherwise if they're given exclusive streaming, and maybe Viacom will keep some of their current episodes offline unless you're a DirecTV subscriber. But you see, I don't I don't think it's a good or bad thing. I mean, sure, they're all bad, but they're also all good. It's like a sports game. It's like Game of Thrones is what it is. To me, no, I love so how are they the good? Movers. Tell me how they're good. Tell me one way in which I mean, any of this is good. They're as good as the Philadelphia Eagles are good. They're as no, bad no, as the New York Mets no, 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 are bad. No, no, no. Tell me. It I, it's bad it's because it's denying me or making it harder for me to watch things. I get That's how it's bad. But tell me well, how any of this is good for me. I don't, I, I don't know about good for uh, – I'm, I'm not saying for you. Is it, is it all about you, Tom? Is that what's well, going for, on Well, for one, for a human being, for an average person who wants to watch things. Look, Here's the thing. We are but peons in this game of, of cable subscribers. You can't tell me how anyone's being good. That's why I say they're all bad guys. Okay. Well, I mean, but but you certainly have people you cheer for, people who you want yeah, to. Yeah, me, have the consumer. <laughs> I cheer for the people, you, all of you out there. I'm cheering for you to be able to watch your freaking shows. <laughs> Tom Merritt, champion of the people. <laughs> By the way, here is the uh, here's the URL that they have. It was amc.tv.com slash Breaking Bad 4 Dish. And then uh, during the actual show, they 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 live streamed the premiere to everyone, which uh, is revolutionary. I've never seen a, a battle tactic like that in a face off like this. Have uh, you? Now compare that, uh, just uh, Jason. If you can put the uh, the the uh, Viacom uh, thing up from yeah, the from the Viacom we'll story, the it's, it's the screenshot on the Directv story. If you can put that one up, I'm loading it. One uh, that one, hey, you, I'm sorry, you probably already closed it, but it's that up. that one. Uh, is is punitive. It says full episodes are currently unavailable. We apologize for the inconvenience. See, that's the problem. Is from a <laughs> PR perspective, they totally wussed out and they're like, "Oh, sorry, sorry, it's this thing, sorry." But meanwhile, AMC, man, they're owning the narrative. They're all like, "Sorry, bro, we love you. We want you to watch Walter White, but guess who doesn't? The big jerks at Dish." But you know what? Aereo wants you to watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it because they want to charge you a lot of money for it, uh, and that's another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. So last week, U.S. District Judge Allison J. Nathan denied the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs in this case being uh, several big networks, uh, a demand for preliminary injunction blocking the service Aereo from allowing time shifting during a live broadcast. If you don't know what Aereo is, it's the service from a company backed by Barry Diller that allows you to watch free over-the-air live broadcasts on the Internet you pay $12 a month for the service, so they're not free to you, but they're saying, look, these are free internet services, and what we're doing, or free over-the-air services, so all we're doing is we're renting antennas 
to people, mm -hmm. our antenna to people, so that when they subscribe to our service, an antenna and a hard drive space gets assigned to them, and they can get a little DVR functionality for all free over-the-air broadcasts and watch it on the Internet. It's no different than a sling box. We're just renting it out to people. The judge said, we agree that the time-shifting aspect is not a problem. Uh, we, d we definitely agree that there could be financial harm to the networks here, but there is definitely financial harm to Aereo if we shut them down. So that cancels it out. Aereo gets to continue to operate their service during the trial. But the trial's not over yet. Yeah, and of course, uh, Barry Diller's awesome quote was, uh, look, that he would pay, of course, the, the, the free over-the-air radio or television stations. They want a cut. Or, and he said, you know what? I'll give you a license fee when you charge a license fee to Radio Shack for selling aerials. But to me, I'm no longer interested in this battle. I'm really interested and annoyed. I'm really fired up over this, uh, over this uh, Pando Daily article. Did you read this? Yeah, Farhad Manju uh, wrote an article on Pando Daily saying, don't root for Aereo. It's the world's most ridiculous startup. Now, immediately you might think, wait a minute, it sounds pretty cool, like allowing me to watch free over-the-air broadcasts on the internet. And yeah, I got to pay them $12. Maybe that's a lot, but it's a service. What he's pointing out is that this shouldn't be a service. You shouldn't have to create a bunch of micro antenna in a room somewhere. And that if Aereo wins, it still doesn't change the fundamental ridiculousness of what copyright regulation is doing to our ability to distribute video. It, it actually entrenches it by saying you have to follow these ridiculous laws that, well, it's illegal to stream video over the air to the broadcast of the Internet. But if you do little antenna and divide it up to everybody, then it's okay. It's, it's perpetuating a fiction that he thinks needs to be dispensed with. Okay, but the problem is, with the tone of the article, I think it's entirely misleading. I find myself in the role of Tom Merritt, where I could say, look, I, yes, it's annoying and it's stupid. It's also the effing law, and I'm sorry it annoys you. And the very tone of this, he says here, the hordes of people who have turned BitTorrent into the planet's best cable system. But BitTorrent is legally dubious, you say. It's not legally dubious. It's rampant piracy out there. Now, granted, there are legitimate uses for BitTorrent, but... He essentially is taking his annoyance with the law. He's so inconvenienced by the law being there that he doesn't understand why we have to have a test case like Aereo. That's the freaking law. That is why you have to have test cases. Now, if you want to go out and lobby and get everyone to change the copyright law, by the way, best of luck to you. It's going to take warriors like Barry Diller who want to spend their own money in order to create stuff like this to shape, to reshape copyright. It's not going to happen with self-righteous articles like this. This does nothing to advance copyright. Uh, but it got you talking about it, didn't you? He sure did. Well, well, and, well I, and I think that's Manju's point. I mean, to be fair, actually, I don't, I don't think he's got a very bad point. And I think he's being intentionally sensationalistic in making it. But I agree with his fundamental point that we have a system right now that could work if everyone would agree to it. But we're fighting against it. That system is BitTorrent. Why is it that the most efficient way to distribute video to everyone is not the way? And, and, and you could say, well, we haven't figured out how to monetize it yet. There are... Absolutely ways to monetize it. And Brom Cohen of BitTorrent has developed those ways. And he has gone to the industry and said, let me help you distribute your content. Let me help you make money. And the industry has resisted it. So what Manju is saying is, okay, here you got old media versus old media trying to come up with a ridiculous way to deal with these laws that they created that are ridiculous. Let's fight the real fight, which is going to the ideal position of using technology the way it should be used instead of creating micro antenna to perpetuate some legal fiction. I think he has a point there. Now, you also have a point, which is that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be cheering for Aereo in the law case or not, exactly. uh, that, that is, depending. But, but he's taking the very maximalist position of like every minute we spend wasting time perpetuating the old way is time that we could have spent actually embracing the new. And I think that's a fair point to make. Okay, well, here's the thing. I mean, obviously, we're very sympathetic to his overall point. Yes, you do. In the book of Brian, yes, you do get to complain about the idiotic state of copyright law. Yes, you do get to be very annoyed that we're not using BitTorrent more effectively. Yes, you get, do get to point out that it's an utterly ridiculous 
manufactured. Uh, there's There would be no market for this in a sensible world. What you don't get to do is actively tell people stop cheering for something that will actually advance reform of copyright law. That's the part that really annoyed me. Well, you, and, you can tell people to do that if you want. Well, fine, but then you get to the, hear Brian say that's help, unhelpful, it's wasteful, and you're setting everyone back because you're justifying piracy and you're actually playing into the hands of old media copyright. I don't think he's justifying piracy. That's the only thing I, I will absolutely disagree with you. I think what he's saying is we have a system that can be used for legal distribution. It's legally dubious. It could be it could be interpreted to mean justifying piracy. I get that, but I I don't think that's what he means. It's that the legality of using BitTorrent has not been established uh, as a business model. And I may be putting too fine a point on it, or maybe I'm saying he should have made the point this way. Uh, I, I think but, you're a little bit too. But it's it's that old thing of there. saying, well, BitTorrent's illegal. No, BitTorrent is not illegal. Using BitTorrent to distribute things illegally is illegal, but BitTorrent is not illegal. Yeah, I, I think you are way inside baseball on that position. I think 99% of the people who read it, 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 it doesn't play that way. But that's all right. We'll, we'll see how this, this shapes out. And personally, for the record, I think that, yes, this is a ridiculous, weaselly way to get around a stupid law that needs to be changed. But the law won't get changed until until stuff like this happens. Well, and I think that's the fair argument against Manju's position here is... Okay, you're right. The ideal that we should move to is that, but you can't just jump to that. Uh, in fact, Barry, D Barry Diller's uh, uh, demonstration here that this is legal may be the thing we need to go, well, wait a minute. If that's legal, why does he have to do a bunch of micro antenna? That's just ridiculous. And that has happened in the past where we fight the legal battle, somebody finds a clever way around it, and then once all the dust settles, everybody goes... Well, we well, actually we don't read the need this anymore. Let's just yes. let's just jump to the end. So and, and and that's just history. That's that's the way these patchwork legislations happen over time until finally it becomes so idiotic. You have to hit a threshold of idiocy before it becomes legally safe for for lawmakers to to look around and be like, yeah, that is dumb. Let's go ahead and do a restructure of that. And that, so that's why this is important. That will be on the frame rate final exam. What is the threshold of idiocy? You'll need to write an essay uh, supporting your answer. <laughs> Let's move on to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Sky TV is launching a service that is, I think, one, another one of these benchmarks along the way to getting what everybody knows they want, which is the ability to just watch the video you want for a fair price whenever, however you want it. Uh, it's called Now TV. And what it's going to deliver is B Sky B's Sky Movies, Sky Sports, and Sky Entertainment over the internet without having to have an additional subscription. So right now they already do this. They offer some internet video for people who are subscribers to their satellite service. B-SkyB, if you don't know, is a, uh, a European uh, company similar to Dish or DirecTV here in the U.S. But this new service says you don't need to buy a satellite from us. For £15 a month, uh, you will be able to get our movie channel streaming over the internet. And we have better movies than Love Film and Netflix. So that's why it's more expensive, because we get them faster, because we have the leverage to do this. You're getting the same movies you're going to see on TV. And they're still going to be able to make pay-per-view available, which is, again, the movies that come right out of the theater. And they offer those from 99 pence up to, I think, three or four pounds. Uh, but again, that's the same pay-per-view you would pay if you had the satellite service. So it's getting what we've all talked about wanting, a la carte, right? Just getting the movies. Yep. And getting it directly over the internet without having to have a cable television subscription. Sky Sports isn't rolling out till later this year, and Sky Entertainment as well. And uh, there's some in the paid content article. There's some uh, sturm and drong about oh they're going to miss the beginning of the English Premier League soccer uh, season. But the fact is they're going to be able to roll this out with big sports on board as well. There's there's nothing I don't like about this story, including, weirdly, the fact that they're charging a lot for it, because I think it's important as as people dip toes into the possibility of, you know, moving all their content to a new media distribution model. Uh, I I understand a place to see whether or not the marketplace would support charging more for that. And if it does, then great. And and this is keep in mind also, while it's much more expensive than Netflix, it's much closer to an a la carte experience where you don't have to have cable at all. Right. Or and do you I, have to and I think one, one of the reasons they're willing to do it and probably one of the reasons they were willing to get their licensees on board with it is they're saying we don't see this as cannibalizing our current users, which is always the fear. Right. 
The, sure. the cable providers have always said, well, we don't want to put too much online because we don't want to lose sales. What Sky is doing, which I think is very smart, is saying, no, there's 10 million people out there in the UK that don't subscribe to Sky. They don't subscribe to anything. And they have the Internet. So we can get them. That's a market we don't have. We're going to make money off them. And, clever, they make them sign up for a Sky ID. So they're part of the system if at some point they go, hey, you know what? I think I'd really rather have more channels. I'd like that satellite subscription. I'd, I'd like to have the, the higher definition signal because the Internet one's going to be adaptive bitrate. At best, it'll be 720p on an Xbox eventually. But at the beginning, it's just adaptive bitrate. So they can upsell you. And, and, and that way, they got you, they're, they're saying, hey, instead of ignoring these people, let's bring them in slowly. Yeah, Eagle Pep in the chat room really nailed it as well. He says it's much, much easier to lower prices than raise them later. Uh, emphasis mine, but I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the slipstream. You know, I, I mentioned it this way on uh, Tech News Today earlier today. Have you, you ever ha known that couple... That's kind of been on the outs for a long time, but they're still, yeah, they, they still hang out. And you're like, ah, oh, it's just so uncomfortable watching. I wish, I wish they just end it all. Yeah. Ma Microsoft and NBC finally did that. They finally, they, they broke up. Uh, they're, they're still friends. Uh, Microsoft's still going to sell ads for NBC oh, I mean, for a while. Microsoft, but Microsoft had moved like, like 85% of its uh, stock. And by stock, I mean clothing out of, uh, out of, out of the NBC apartment by now, right? I mean, yeah. it was just it's really just the last 15% of that underwear. That was the thing, right? I mean, NBC had the MSNBC channel back in 2005 all to themselves. And they seem to really like that. So now MSNBC.com redirects to NBCNews.com, no longer to MSN's MSNBC section. And eventually, in 2013, they're going to launch a new MSNBC.com that will be a companion website just for the television channel, MSNBC. So uh, the television channel will remain MSNBC? For now. I, there was nothing in any of these articles about renaming anything. We'll see. Uh, actually, I did see. I did see one that says uh, said that, that I thought at least said new name. I didn't know if that referred to the website. No, or the, I or think that's probably talking about the fact that MSNBC redirects to NBCNews.com. But uh, nothing said that MSNBC, the channel, is changing their name yet. Although I wouldn't be surprised if that happened eventually. Yeah, I would. I would actually bet on it because it's. I mean, if there's one thing these guys love to do is have everything uniform. I mean, well, and that made. it's a weird. I, I I can see NBC executives being split on this because on the one hand they've branded MSNBC. It means something to people. It means left leaning it means news coverage. Yeah, more importantly, it means something different than NBC News because if you took NBC, MSNBC and just suddenly called it NBC News on cable, then I don't think that's good. Just as CNBC it means something different than NBC News, I think it's important that they that they if if they have the legal right to keep the MS in there, I think they really should. Yeah, and I think they do. I mean, they they've been able to keep it in the in the television channel up till now. And uh, MSNBC or NBC News is going to continue to feed content to MSN. Hey, MSN. I got, I got I got, I got the prediction. The prediction will be they'll keep the name MSNBC if they can legally, uh, but they will change the meaning of the MS part and it'll be like more social NBC or they'll be like that'll be their new advertising campaign is to sort of redefine yeah, something maybe. About Microsoft or MSN. But what, what I was going to say is Microsoft will still take NBC News stories and put them on MSN, but Microsoft's hiring a news team. So that, uh, that yes. could cause friction in the future, possibly. Uh, yes. So then we get to see the uh, the post breakup like debates if we want to go back to our original metaphor. Yeah, right. Uh, there's an article on Ars Technica last week uh, call about Miracast. It's a Wi-Fi technology that makes it easy to stream video from one device to another using their Wi-Fi connections, but not over the network. So it's much easier than an AirPlay or something like that because you don't have to negotiate a network connection. It's like Wi-Fi Direct, if you've ever heard of that. It says, I will connect the Wi-Fi in my television with the Wi-Fi in my tablet and stream the video directly to that. It a, it's a, seems like a really good protocol, and you don't necessarily need new hardware. They say new hardware could be optimized better for it, but on existing Wi-Fi hardware that's out there, 802.11n and above, you can install new software and be able to use Miracast. So it's AirPlay for everyone.
Is this similar to what like the Sonos does? Because I know the Sonos has like a Wi-Fi like network, but that but but it only speaks to its own devices that doesn't show up. I, right, and I, that's why Sonos works so well. Is it's not negotiating uh, all the time over your. Now it does does do some negotiating over, over the network to find your computer, but the right. connection between the different speakers is direct, right. uh, and so, that's. I mean, essentially, if we're looking like a, like basically like an open source AirPlay situation, right? I don't know if I don't use the word open source unless I know it's actually GPL. So I'm not going to say that. But I'll it, use open it's, source it's a, to mean mustard. It's cross platform. That is your there that you is go. that is your safe word. It's, it's <laughs> cross more platform open than AirPlay. That's for sure. Uh, the problem is you need the device makers to get on board, even if it is cross platform, because if not everybody's using it, then it doesn't work and the uh, the device makers can decide to spin it and turn it into something that's proprietary and only works with their devices. Uh, so the, they have a long way to go to get it to where it's ubiquitous. DLNA is is really good, too, and that hasn't caught on as widely as it, it probably needs to. But I thought this was pretty in- interesting. Absolutely. Also, Nielsen today uh, said that users who were most likely to stream movies dropped by 6% from last year, while those who preferred streaming TV on Netflix rose by 8%. So... Netflix becoming a television-oriented service now, more so. Not, not a huge surprise, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but also keep in mind, like, that headline makes it sound a little bit like movie watchers are leaving Netflix and TV watchers are coming into Netflix. They're very likely, I would imagine, most of these would be the same people. I don't, did I read the headline? Just, what's that? Did I read the headline? Uh, you, you did, I thought. I don't know. So the headline is Netflix movie streaming takes backstage to TV because I thought I just said that Nielsen had a story. So, yes, the headline is deceptive, but the Nielsen numbers are not. They're just saying. No, 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 no. Correct. Correct. But but even the Yeah. Yeah. But but my my, my point is um, uh, it, it it you hate me, the headline writer at CNET. No, no. <laughs> Stop. What is this? I, I, I think uh, here's the other factor that I like to consider is and we've talked about this before. That, of course, movies tend to be two, three hours long, whereas when you invest in a TV show and you start eating them like potato chips because I physically eat my movies, <laughs> uh, you, you obviously consume many more hours, many more bits, and, and much more of the time. So I, I, I don't necessarily know how to interpret this as necessarily a big change or not. What do you think? Well, I, it seems obvious to me, right? Because we know that they lost the Stars deal and there have been fewer movies and they've been adding lots of TV deals and they've got their own original programming in the shoot. Uh, so it seems logical to me that if somebody's watching Netflix, they're going to start watching more TV shows because there's more TV shows on there uh, and, yeah. be- and, and more quality TV shows on there. But I think one of the, the things is the a number of hours is going up, as we mentioned the other week. And so even if there are more TV shows, the worry that, oh, without a bunch of hot new movies, Netflix won't survive – is not becoming a problem because they have good TV shows. And and even if they're seen as more of a TV streaming network, I don't think it's a big deal. No, I don't think it's a bad thing at all because if you think about it in terms of quality, like if I say Netflix movies, you know, and you're thinking of the spectrum here, you might be like, oh, they're mostly good. I could think of a few good ones, but I really wish they had X, Y, and Z. But if I say Netflix TV shows, you instantly think of all those, you know, Sons of Anarchy, Breaking Bad, uh, you know, all these fantastic shows. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, there's a browser extension out there. I think it's available for almost all the browsers. Chrome, Safari, Opera, Firefox, called Herp Derp. Uh, if you're <laughs> watching this. a lot of YouTube these days and you're just sick of the comments down there on certain videos, you can use this to change all of the comments to just say Herp Derp Derp Herp Herp Derp Derp. <laughs> I love this. Hey, and I was thinking about this. Like, uh, why Why do you suppose, and this has nothing to do with Herp Derp necessarily, outside of like universally. I once asked on Twitter, which would you rather have, paper cuts to the eyeballs or reading nothing but YouTube comments? And everyone was like, paper cuts to the eyeballs, of course, duh. But why do you suppose it's in YouTube's interest to not allow some kind of reputation mechanic on on YouTube for comments? I mean, I wish I could set like, you know, like my troll scale and uh, based on reputation, they have it. You know, Xbox has it with the uh, with the online characteristics. Is it because they almost want to feed the twelve year olds who want to feel important in this safe place, or is there any logical reason for it? Do you think? I don't know. When did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is that kind of question. It's- You're like, so why is YouTube making so much money off of uh, not allowing a reputation system? I, I don't know that it's in their interest. It may be that they just haven't prioritized it and done it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Seems like, like seems I think I think a better question is like, why huh? isn't YouTube doing more to give you better moderation tools? Sure. Sure, or especially on your own channel, right? I mean, I, I you of know, course, actually, no, is- having some uh, some experience with this with Sword and Laser, we don't have nearly the level of horrible trolls that I see on other YouTube videos because we have a very active moderator. Be- because of you, you do it. No, oh. I'm saying, I'm saying, like, the, the, you, know, you want to see some trolls? Go to the scam. We school. have very active moderators that go in and remove posts as soon as they get out of hand. Which, you, which is easy to do. Uh, yeah. And then you do that initially in the, in the like first few hours after a posting, it kind of tromps down on a lot of, lot of the problems. And you would kind of encourage and respond to the people who are asking questions and show that there are people there. And that's just good classic, like that since the 90s, that's been good moderation tactics. But yeah, it would be nice if there were some more automatic things that you wouldn't have to take active engagement to get rid of stuff but the best communities always have active engagement so maybe that's why yeah fair enough fair right. enough let's look at tube tops we only got a couple today now this is not on woot anymore but engadget posted this last week and i hadn't heard of this product before the silicon dust hd home run prime cable card tuner uh, allows you to put three cable card slots into any home theater pc now, why would you want to do that? So you could record three channels at once? Well, yeah, it, it, gives, you, it gives you the ability to record three channels at once, exactly. Uh, I, I think that's the biggest advantage to it. And, and Woot was selling it for just $130, uh, but they're only $180 to $200 elsewhere. So uh, it's, it's a pretty nice little plug-in to, if, you you're, what, if you're building your own box. Yeah, part of me wants to be, I, I have nothing but respect for the people who build their own boxes. Because I, I knew somebody in the late 90s who built his own uh, myth box. And it was it was just legendary to see what he could do. It was like real magic to me at the time. Also, uh, XBMC for Android was announced today. It has the same core features as the desktop versions, although it does have to do a, a little more software acceleration for the video uh, because of the limited capability of most Android hardware. But you'll be able to, XBMC is the basis for Boxy. It's the basis for a lot of media center applications. It's been around forever. It's a great media center. So if you have an Android box, maybe a Logitech review, you would be able to theoretically use this app on there and use XBMC. Well, I think this is only going to get more important. And we've talked about this before. One of the advantages of the Google TV platform and having an Android uh, set-top box is that you'll get more uh, more regular hardware revisions. And as the hardware gets better and better, I would imagine alternate um, interfaces like these will only become more popular. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, shall we then move on to the film film? <laughs> AMC's Breaking Bad season five premiere, most watched episode ever. With 2.9 million viewers, most watched Breaking Bad episode sure. ever. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not the one. Yeah, certainly. It's like bigger than the Super Bowl. Right. 2.9 yeah. million viewers. Uh, but, but wow. Now, this is an argument for putting your stuff online and letting people catch up, right? Because oh my gosh, how does absolutely. the season premiere of the last season end up being your most watched it's because people are like, oh, I've caught up. I, I went to iTunes or I went to Hulu or I went wherever and, I, and, I, and I'm all caught up now. I watched it on Netflix and I'm ready to go. I think that AMC is clearly very smartly positioned with their long form narratives on television uh, to take advantage of the change in technology and their, their partnership with Netflix, I think, is definitely you, I, you, you have to attribute some significant portion of this success specifically to the Netflix agreements. Be- making it so much easier for people to get caught up definitely, definitely matters, I think. Also, down at Comic-Con last weekend, uh, Peter Jackson showed a Hobbit trailer, and apparently it was fantastic, uh, rave reviews. But if you remember, we talked about this before, he had showed one at CinemaCon that was 48 frames per second, and everyone complained how it looked. This time, he showed it at 24 frames per second, because he said, A, after CinemaCon, I realized you need more than just a few minutes to get people used to it and immersed in it. And he's like, I didn't want the story to be about 48 frames per second. I wanted the story to be about hobbits. Sorry, Peter. Yeah, we, we made it about 48 a- frames per second. 
I think I think it was a really smart move on his behalf. And if he had a time machine, I'm sure he'd like to go back and hold back what 48 uh, frames per second looks like until he could get everybody in a position where they'd have to spend almost three hours experiencing it to where by the end it stopped feeling so bizarre and weird, but instead felt like magical. And then like the next day when they're thinking back to the movie, they're able to visualize things much more vividly than they ever had with a 24 frames per second uh, movie. I mean, that's, of course, you know, me. Uh, with rose-colored glasses on what might have been and, and what his motivations might be. But I think it's smart of him to hold it back. Yeah, and, and, and it is getting universally rave reviews, as I mentioned. A uh, union of two companies that bring you the content you like that I, has made some nerds just explode with joy. Legendary Entertainment, those are the folks that bring you 300, Inception, The Dark Knight, Watchmen, uh, have bought Nerdist. And they've made Chris Hardwick the head of digital for Legendary Entertainment. He'll still continue to do all of the things he's done in his Nerdist empire, but now with the backing of a really awesome studio. Wow. Congratulations to Chris Hardwick. I mean, he's done such a great job of, of branding himself as, as the passion of everyone on the Internet. And, uh, you know, even, even, you know, obviously with like The Walking Dead and so much of the Nerdist content. Uh, congratulations. That's fantastic. And a match made in heaven for viewers, right? Because uh, folks, you know, they, they, they love the nerd content. They love uh, the Nerdist, which still run out of his comic book shop in Los Angeles. And they love these movies from Legendary. And Legendary is very much on the side of geeks. They're looking for good, geeky stuff to make. I, I, I'm interested to see, they're saying like, no, we're just going to let Chris continue to do his thing. And I think that's very smart. I'm interested to see what kind of magical nerd baby will be born from this yeah. union. The, the question is, like, uh, like uh, uh, again, on the positive side, you might see a Nerdist with much more access and a much more interesting behind-the-scenes stuff. Or you might see the influence of Legendary saying, well, we understand that you want to see how the sausage made, but we're not really happy with how this sausage is being made. Maybe you can look the other way. So it'll be interesting to see which way it goes. Although I'll tell you one thing, uh, I do think the chat room is right when they when they disappointedly said, great, now I'll we'll never be on this show. <laughs> What they said? What? Oh, he'll never be it's, on frame rate. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh well. Good. Good. Good on you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> Game of Thrones season three news came fast and furious at Comic Con. Uh, the casting announcements are. We don't have time to read through all of them, but some of the big ones uh, you may have already heard. The Diana Rigg was going to be uh, Grandma Tyrell, the Olena Tyrell, the Queen of Thorns. Uh, but yeah. also the guy from the British version of The Office, Mackenzie Cook, is going to be playing Orel. I wish I knew who he was. I've never seen, this is my confession, I've never seen The British Office. Oh, uh, he, was, he was the Dwight Schrute character on The British Office. Got it. Um, I'm almost, you know what, I'm actually really glad I haven't seen it now because I would not be able to, like if Dwight Schrute was suddenly on, on this show, I would not be able to see anything but Dwight Schrute. Also, so we're getting uh, Jojen and Mira Reed finally. They should have been in season two and they kind of kept them away from the story uh, for cost reasons, I guess, trying to keep the cast cost down. But they will show up in this next season. Yeah, and, and I think that's fine. I don't think that uh, that having two more characters for people to swallow since season one would have necessarily been a good decision for the television show. And, and they have so much uh, credit in my bank that it's like I am not worried. Like, whatever they say, yes, you're probably making the right decision. Celise Baratheon, Shireen, Tormund Giantsbane. I mean, a any of these other castings that caught your eye? Uh, no, none of them did. I Again, like, I read... All I read was a lot of news and actors that I don't even want to. This is one of the few, and this is rare for me, Tom. You know, normally it's like I dig in and I want to get all the inside sauce. This is one of the few cases where I want to wrap my own present. It's like, and, and it's enough for you to tell me why I should be excited about these. And that's all I want to hear. I am thrilled. Ron Perlman was in The Punisher. Well, yes, it's of, of a sort, sir. Did you hear about this? No, thing? I didn't. What's this about? Okay, so yeah, earlier today, you know, we like to start off with an interesting video on frame rate. And in this case, for those of you who did audio only, it was a, it was a fantastic uh, tribute to the Columbia Pictures opener from Lonely.Geek Zach Holder. But, like, I had five people send this over to me. And as of now, it only has, like, 35,000 views. This is a fan film. It's a 10-minute short film called Dirty Laundry. Most interesting, hashtag Dirty Laundry. 
Uh, it's well shot. It looks like a lot of the really good fan films that you see on YouTube. It's it's a Punisher short with a little twist. It happens to star the actor who played the Punisher in that horrible night or 2004 version of the movie. And a little guy you may have heard of, Ron Perlman. It, here's, here's what I think is fantastic. If you, if you scroll down and take a look at the page here, Jason, you can see that it just says it's very understated. I think this is very internet savvy. At the, right underneath it says, question, what's the difference between justice and punishment? Hashtag dirty laundry. Follow the dialogue, and it gives the Twitter accounts of Thomas Jane, the guy who's in the main character, the, uh, Addie Shankar Brand, who did the film. Uh, I, and I'm fascinated to see where this is going to go because it's total fangasm when I saw this. It was, it was, it's very well done. This short, this fan film is the best Punisher film ever made. And the fact that it stars the guy who played the Punisher in the terrible version. How did it, he get that? How did he get him to do that? I have no idea. My guess is that's why he specifically is saying follow the dialogue, because if you go and check it out, these people, of course, they're all retweeting people who say nice things. They're answering questions right now. This is a case of a Hollywood type really embracing the new media mechanic because that's what plays well. Talent and effort speak volumes on the Internet. So does humility. And it's unlike anything I've seen from Hollywood out here. I'm really excited about this. It's, and it, it is a difficult thing for an actor to be able to do because my guess is he doesn't have the rights to the character. Right. And by playing him, he risks the, raising the ire of the studio possibly uh, without, unless they got the studio's permission, which they may have. Uh, well, there's so many, so many intricate things in the way movies are made that this could run afoul of. So well, he's either notice, brave so. or it's very organized. You, you notice also that the title is doesn't say anything about the Punisher. Right. And by the way, we saw we when I was talking to uh, to Alex Albrecht, uh, I told him how disappointed I was that he named his Voltron fan film like a Voltron fan film. But he said that's the only way to get it explode for viral because people need to search it out and find it instantly. And if people are saying like, yeah, what's the name of that Punisher fan film? They're going to type in Punisher fan film and they won't find it because nowhere does the Punisher appear in the name. Nowhere does fan film in there up here so and you'll notice the closest he gets is this quote from thomas jane that says i wanted to make a fan film for a character i've always loved and believed in unnamed a love letter to frank castle and his fans it was an incredible experience with everyone on the project throwing in their time just for the fun of it a statement that they're not making any bucks it's been a blast to be apart from start to finish we hope the friends of frank enjoy watching it as much as we did in making it i i gotta tell you tom i think i think he just sincerely wanted to do something good and beautiful to, sh uh, to, to capture whatever it is he loved. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. It's just it's a little bit risky. And you can tell that in the fact that they don't reference the Punisher in anything but the tag. Yeah, you get it in the tag is what I'm seeing here. That's, I, but it's, that's it. It's, but that's, I, it, that's not copyright violation right, to exactly. tag something. That can, you One can put would anything think, in there. Although stranger things have happened in the world of yeah. copyright legislation. Well, it tells me that it's probably not part of any sneaky viral marketing campaign. I think it's just people, you know, uh, the, the spirit of good storytelling is alive and well, both is still in Hollywood and definitely in new media. All right. Uh, finally, Deadline's weekly YouTube channel ranking is kind of boring. Uh, this is for the week that ended July 11th. Not much happened. A lot of people just didn't watch. They had a lower, lower viewing because I think people were out for the July 4th holiday uh, and stuff, yeah. but but one one that was up was Awesomeness TV, a uh, a cartoon channel that went way up from number eleven to number four, which I hadn't heard of before. Have you watched anything on there? Uh, I thought that we had talked about them last week, uh, but uh, but yeah, uh, uh, obviously that was a big move. Um, I actually didn't take the time to really look. It's interesting. I, I'm really interested to see which ones consistently are hang out right around the. Well, shut top. up! Cartoons also jumped way up from, from number seven to number two. So maybe maybe it's just like a. An, oh, well, I, I was thinking of shut up cartoons, and I said awesomeness TV. Sorry, awesomeness okay, TV awesomeness, did have a jump really from eleven to four. So shut up cartoons that went from seven Got to it. two. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah, well, and keep in mind also, like, even look at these total views. We, we live in a world where where the uh, or the weekly views could be skewed by a single runaway viral hit. And so, yeah, I mean, you never know. I think this will be a lot more dynamic and interesting to watch than uh, traditional media Nielsen numbers. Shall we check in on the amazingly weird results of our summer movie draft? Who is this in number one? Brian Brushwood. 
No, it's definitely not Brian Brushwood. It's no, just I'm asking Humphrey Brian Brushwood. Dunn. Who is this at number one? I don't recognize this name. Yeah, dude, uh, Justin jumped all the way up to number one, and I think that's because all of his movies came out in the exact same 20-minute window. And uh, Justin, of course, he was awarded uh, TED, which is now the number one, uh, uh, the, uh, I guess, dollar do for dollar do spent. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but but both uh, uh, Amazing Spider-Man came out on the third. Ice Age, Age Continental Drift came out on the 13th. He is now out of movies, but at this moment is number one with some decent momentum. He's definitely going to cross over past $700 million. So the question is, and of course, Scott's out of movies. So I think it's clear that Scott's totally out. Yeah, Scott totally has been mathematically eliminated at this point because none of his movies are bringing any more dollars. Correct, correct. But Tom, of course, now uh, this is going to be an awesome finish because you have Total Recall and Paranorman coming up. Sarah, with only $90 million, has The Dark Knight Rises coming out this weekend, right? Uh, yeah, that's the lead, right? This, this is the week where we start to find out what's going to happen. When we, when we set the table, we've been waiting this whole time. Yeah, you see that I've got 600 whatever, 629 million. Uh, Justin has 686 million. But The Dark Knight will will finally bring us to parody. Now, Veronica's not entirely out of it, but... Yeah, I mean, I, it could be that, the uh, what, Sparkle makes $500 million. I'm, which I will, think it's going to make a lot. I don't, I don't know about $500 million. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, now, now, where are you at? Let's go ahead and, and I was... I have previously publicly said that I don't think The Dark Knight could possibly beat uh, The Avengers, partly because The Avengers was on, was on a perfect uh, holiday weekend and it appealed... To, it's the kind of movie you would bring your kids to. And more than in years, I've heard people watching The Avengers more than one time. But now I'm sort of in the middle of the echo chamber of the Batman hype engine. And it's and plus, yep. like the views have been super positive. And now I'm totally I'm totally resending my prediction. And now I want to say that it's got to be the Dark Knight. I've been saying that all year. Uh, it's 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 absolutely true that the Dark Knight is going to at least match, if not surpass, the Avengers in dollars. But let's just say that it makes six hundred million, right? Avengers sure. made six thirteen. Let's say let's say Dark Knight makes six thirteen, and then Sarah has six fifty, and I have six twenty nine. At that right. point, it comes it's down to the campaign and the Expendables two versus versus Total Recall and Paranorman. No, you. I. I. I'm still. My smart money's still on Tom Merritt. Even. Even if uh, the Dark Knight outperforms the Avengers, and I think it's going to be a photo finish because the Expendables two is August seventeenth, as is Paranorman and Sparkle. And by the way, Justin is not out on this. I mean, he's got the momentum. Well, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Ice Age. Ice Age can still bring in a few more uh, million dollars, but it's going to be tough for him. It's going to be a stretch. Yeah. Oh, so, so excited. This is good. It's turning out to be a really good year. Yeah, I, I'm liking the way this is uh, going to finish up. Let's talk about what we're watching. What we're watching. Have you been watching anything? I have, as I just typed in the doc just ah. now. Of course, of course, uh, Breaking Bad, which we've got to talk about. Uh, we'll do later. a spoiler zone on Breaking Bad. You want to? Absol absolutely. Right. Yes. Uh, the newsroom. Look, Tom, I need you to talk me through. I I've only watched the first two episodes of the newsroom, but but they were so full of self-importance that I that I actually found myself not finding time to watch the third. Tell me. Come on, man. Tell me. Tell me. I need to watch the third. Tell me. I'll enjoy it. No. I won't. I won't do that uh, because if that's what's bothering you, you're not. You're not going to like it. Uh, I, I, we watched the new episode last night, and Mo Eileen and I both had the same reaction, which is when they're doing the news, when they're breaking the news. Like this was the um, the shooting of uh, Gabrielle Giffords was okay. was the it was the the current event in this one. When that happened, it was gold. It was television magic. It was awesome. We were on the edge of our seats. It was so fun to watch. When they were doing the, the, there were the bit about the interpersonal relationships, some of it was okay, some of it just wasn't that believable, and it totally lost me. Uh, so I, I guess I'll say some of that self-important, like, we need to do the news for the good of the people, tones down. It never goes away, but it tones down a little bit, and it's more about, like, doing quality news and the fight against corporations and, and, and unequal pressures. Uh, but when they're not doing that, and they can't do that all 60 minutes, I understand that, uh, it's it's inconsistent. Do you 
find yourself falling in love with any of the characters? I mean, obviously they made a very compelling, uh, you know, primary character, but uh, I, I, whose name I don't even remember. Will That's McAvoy. How, there you go, Will McAvoy. Uh, do you do you fall in love with anyone else? Uh, you know what? I can't remember the boss's name. He's an iconic uh, actor, uh, but but Will McAvoy's immediate boss. I, yes. I, I, I love him. I love that yes. they're painting him as a dr- as an old man who's a drunk, and they're unapologetic about it. I think that's fantastic. Not because I think people should be drunks, but it's like that actually happens. That's oh, you know sure. that's a little bit of a you know real world raw aspect to it, and it's not funny. It's it's sad, uh, yeah. but but it adds a, a load of depth and angst to a character that I I think is probably going to end up blowing up uh, later on and, and be pretty awful. Um, I I do like the producer, the executive producer. I think she's good. Uh, I, but yeah, other than that, no, I haven't really fallen in love with any. So, uh, I also have been watching Tron and you remember last time we talked about this, uh, I was saying that I'm a little bit weird, worried that it's just going to be a monster of the week type adventure. And I wanted more character development. They definitely have done that. In fact, they had a crossover. They had Olivia Wilde play Cora, who she played in Tron legacy in there. And they're actually giving more of that depth and backstory. Uh, it's still gorgeous to watch, man. It's like, I love, I love. I don't know. It, it, it really sweeps me up in it. I don't know why I'm so involved with this cartoon, but I am. No, I've, I've heard nothing but good things, nothing from po- but positive things about it, especially her appearance as well. Let's do some feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Our first piece of feedback comes from a fan. You'll find out why it's a fan in a minute. Uh, hello, Frame Rateers. I know a person who is involved in television production and is working on a new show for the History Channel about tugboats on the Great Lakes. The show is being called Great Lake Warriors, which caused this person to facepalm and ask why. They were told it was for Netflix, SEO, search engine optimization. History Channel feel their demographic will likely be searching Netflix for other shows that start with war and want to come up in those searches. Since hearing this, I have noticed other shows with war variants slapped on in a kludgy way. I also thought that is a frame rate topic. Question three. (laughs) Networks are clearly looking ahead at a life on Netflix from day one. Why when they get nothing extra? I uh, that's a very good question. And I'll do I'll be perfectly honest, Tom, that uh, most of these questions actually came to us last week. And remember, we didn't have time for it. So they're still in the dock right now. But if you don't mind, I'm going to have you read the rest of these questions because I wanted to remember I challenged everyone to uh, to to feed to to get to chip in on the HBO Go ethical issue because I got a bunch of different tweets after the show. So if you don't mind, I'm going to dig those up while you read this next one. Oh, uh, well, okay. He's got three questions, so I was going to ask you those three questions. But networks are clearly looking ahead at Netflix from day one. Why when they get nothing extra? They do get something extra. They do get paid for their their stuff ending up on Netflix. Uh, Is an SEO title Poop Storm on its way? Yes, probably. Uh, Probably video title Poop Storm in general, not just Netflix. And does Netflix need a Matt Cutts to trim away the chaff? I believe they have. Not Matt Cutts, obviously, from Google, but they have someone uh, like that who's involved in trying to make Discovery better. Uh, Not the Discovery Channel, but make discovering videos on Netflix easier and better all the time. So this is a really interesting email. I'm I'm really interested in the fact that, well, again, we're starting to see the sea change, right? This is always the way it goes. Oh, I don't know if we want to be on Netflix. That's uh, It's going to undermine us. And then someone like the History Channel goes, Actually, uh, we've sold a lot of DVDs based on people finding stuff that we do on Netflix. And more people are watching History Channel in the off hours because they saw stuff on Netflix. And we, we actually get money for the stuff that we license to Netflix. So let's try to get people to watch more stuff on Netflix. Let's get them to discover History Channel stuff. That's, that's how it happens. That's how it changes. Well, it's, always, it's always the people who have nothing to lose that decide to invest in the platform that nobody knows if it's going to make any money, money. And so it's good to see stuff like you know History Channel deriving some kind of benefit from it. Bill Meeks writes, hi, Tom and Brian. I was thinking about this this morning, and you know what would be really fun on frame rate? A fan film festival special. Huh. 
Specifically, you could have people do recreations of scenes from movies or TV shows in whatever medium they chose, video, animation, source, filmmaker. They could either choose from a pre-selected list of scenes or you could have them pick their own. Alternatively, you could come up with one to three one-minute scripts for people to choose from and could announce the special a month in advance and promote it every week leading up to the special. I think something like this would be a good fit for Frame Rate since it's largely a show about online content and already features a ton of fan-submitted content. I like it. Well, yeah, I like that idea as well. It's uh, I, The question is, and I guess I'm really going to kick it back to the fans, because to me, I just assume that everyone who cares about our show is a media maker of some variety and would like a, a chance to showcase their their efforts. But I don't know if, uh, if, if that's not the case at all. So I guess we'll just have to tell people to send in something to frame rate at twit.tv if you guys want to see this happen. Yeah, let, let, don't send us your, your submission yet. No, no, uh, no, no. Send no, us no. your thoughts on how we should conduct this contest. Because uh, we also need to find time to be able to like put it out there properly with rules and and tell people what to submit and, and all that that sort of thing. Uh, so we want to make it as simple, efficient, easy, and fun as possible. Correct, correct. We don't want this to be a giant homework assignment. And no, you can't just sum, submit a bunch of clips from Pond Five. We're going to be wise to that trick. Yeah, well, we we know some people there. So <laughs> or will we? Or will. Uh, okay, so let's let's jump over this right here. Uh, one of the things we got a couple of of people chiming in on the HBO Go ethicality issue and i grabbed one example of each i'll start off right here uh actually I'll, I'll let you read this one since it's it's pro brian uh brian was within his rights to leave it on his father-in-law's roku because if he logs into hbo go on his ipad from another location the roku will be disabled while he is logged on only one ip location will be logged into it at one time this is the same for Netflix and Hulu Plus. I can run Netflix and Hulu Plus on multiple Rokus in my house, single IP location at the same time, but if I log on to Netflix from work devices in my house, it will conflict and get logged off. The companies my, have already handled this ethical dilemma in their design. My guess is also they probably have a limit to how many devices you can activate at all, because I know I ran into that with my Audible account. Yeah, sometimes like, uh, they do. Yeah, so if that's the case, then, then it would be, but... On the flip side, Greg Kramer that actually says, doesn't make it ethical or not, but we'll, I'll, I'll save it. Yeah, no, see, okay. Well, on the flip side, Greg Kramer says, as for Brian's HBO Go question, I concur with what Tom eventually said about the subscription applying to a household, in quotes, and more crassly to an entity that could reasonably include only one potential HBO subscription. A cohabitating married couple equal only one potential subscription, even though they're two people. Likewise, an adult child in the same house around 18, or I guess above 18, could have her own HBO subscription, but has a close enough nexus to her home that she is not a realistic potential subscriber. So as far as the, the first one from Walt, I mean, that doesn't make it ethical, the fact that they've designed a way to stop you from breaking the terms of service. It doesn't make it ethical to do it. That's like saying, eh, it's okay to break into houses because you can put locks on doors. So no, if the door is unlocked, it's... just walk on in because you could have put the lock. I mean, they put a lock there. That's not that's not uh, that's not what it's like at all. It's more like um, it's more like you get a con actually I'm going to just get killed in this metaphor. But I, I disagree about but no, but I'm saying is because they put a, a break into doing it doesn't make it OK to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like it makes no. it less likely that you'll get away with it. That's all. No, but 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 Tom, no, nobody snuck anything. The, it said we open up the Roku box. No, but says, you're you're def you're saying it's it is ethical because it's ethical. No, I'm saying I'm <laughs> saying it is. The, the question is That's the definition of ethical is whether or not it is the intention of HBO Go that its service be used in this method, and if it sets up a list of rules then you have to assume that is the method in which they intended it to be used. So if you are using it in the way that their rules say to use it, I have to assume that's ethical in that situation. No, uh, just, because the, 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 just because the design of the service didn't anticipate one way that breaks the rules doesn't mean that they're okay with it. HBO is not saying, oh, because we gave you 10 devices, you can now have 10 devices anywhere in the world. So send them to your friends. That, 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 that's not the way. That's not right. But, but they don't say that, but they're the ones who designed the service in that way. And they put a lot of time and effort to say but that, how. No, but you're absolutely wrong. Used. That doesn't mean that it's ethical just because uh, you can get away with it. I, again, I'm not saying get what away if they, with it. In, in other words, MP3s. No, out. here we go. MP3s are not DRM'd. Does that mean it's okay to pirate them? No. They designed but, the service so that you can copy them easily. So they must be okay with you just copying them and giving them to everyone. Touche, sir. Well, in that case, then why don't they say 
Uh, ex- well, they probably do in the terms of service, which, of course, none of us ever read. Uh, <laughs> wow, that's a, really inter- that's a really interesting turnaround because now, like, I, I, is, it, is it breaking the rules that I installed my Audible account on Bonnie's uh, uh, iPhone and that I... See, now that's even more interesting. HBO, I feel like this is pretty clear cut. I know you're trying to find Weasel Room where it's okay for your father-in-law to keep watching it, but it's pretty clear cut that... First of all, no, 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 no. First, stop stop saying that. I already said said it's totally wrong. It's totally wrong, and I'm not trying to find any reason for Weasel Room at all. I am just fascinated by the arbitrariness of where this line is. I don't feel like this line is very arbitrary. I feel like it's... Hey, you bought a cable subscription, so uh, the person who bought the cable subscription should be able to use the service and not, a, you know, and not anybody else. Audible is different, though. Are you buying a subscription for your family? That's a personal device with a personal book. It, and if it was a real book, you'd be able to loan it to Bonnie. But is that, you know, is that what Audible intends or not? I well, think I mean, that's a I, trickier could I loan situation. It to Bonnie, but not to my father-in-law? Yeah, I know. Well, that's no, exactly. And plus you take it on, you take it with you on the road. I mean, what was That's a grayer the, area to me. What would the difference be between a Roku and an iPad? What if what if I activated Bonnie's iPad with HBO Go and then left it at well, my father-in-law's here's, place? Here, here's I think the difference in the way we're approaching this. You're looking at HBO Go as the service, and I'm not. And HBO doesn't look at it as the service. HBO Go is a bonus thing you get for subscribing to HBO on your television. And Uh, so everything else flows from there as far as HBO is concerned. They're saying, hey, you get HBO on your home service, and so we're giving you this fun extra thing because of that. And so your father-in-law isn't paying for your HBO service. If uh, HBO was audible, suddenly it is a different conversation from where I'm sitting. I would say that an economist would be very disappointed in that interpretation. Whether they label it a bonus that you get on top of your service or not, uh, the fact is, is you pay your money to HBO, and among the things you get is HBO Go. But, and where, if but case, here, let me. But you're you're jumping back to another way of doing things by bringing in an economist. What you were saying is it's ethical if. It, by considering the intentions of HBO. And all I'm saying is the intention of HBO is that this is a bonus add-on to your subscription. Well, you see, and that's just it, is I'm saying I don't know the intention of HBO. All I know is the rules. And so if you go by the rules that HBO set up, then you have to assume that those are the intentions. Yeah, but we're talking about ethics, not legalities. That's all, Going by the rules is, is talking about legalities. Okay, well then, uh, ethics as far as is, ethics- does Brian intend for me to eat all of his cake when he says have some cake this is not it's not against the law for me to eat all his cake (laughs) where are you going to get to the part with me punching a grandmother where is where is this headed tom (laughs) don't take grandmother's cake (laughs) uh cake's a lie anyway um yeah no but this is this is a good uh this is a good discussion i think because it illustrates the tension between what the companies want us to do with our content and what we want to do with our content. And, sure. and I, and I, and I think that's one of the fear you, you are demonstrating one of the fears of HBO, which is that if we make it available directly to people over the internet, then they'll just all share the login and nobody will ever pay for HBO. It's a ridiculous well, fear. And I don't think people will do that in, in large amounts, but it is one of those things where, like, no, we won't do that. And, okay, and well, people said that take- about undrm MP3s for a long time. They're like, oh, but then nobody will buy MP3s. But people do. They're buying them in greater and greater numbers all the time. So, so by that logic, then, uh, when you go, let's go back to the 90s with all these cell phone plans that are in, with free minutes for friends and family or for family that you would indicate and you would get people in your circle. It's like, well, what does it mean to be in a family? And then finally, uh, over, you know, I guess what, seven or eight years later, finally you had entire advertisements dedicated to full on, you know, wink, wink, like, oh, yeah, no, Frank, he's my cousin. I don't know. Granted, he's three feet taller than me and of a different ethnicity. Uh, if, if, if they set the rules, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's like it's like if the rules are you get up to three devices and uh, and that no two can be on different IP addresses at the same time, then I I I don't know how to interpret that as anything else. You than- 
get three devices. Not you and your father-in-law get three devices. No, your family. And 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 I'm sorry, but my father-in-law is my family, and no amount of acting like otherwise. And is so is I, yeah, but I mean, where's the limit then? If you say family, did now now you're forcing them to write it to say, yeah, and by family we mean immediate opposite. family, and by family we mean people who cohabitate in the household, because but, that's okay. not their intention. Their intention isn't to say you. If we give this, you can pass it around to whomever you want, as long as you can somehow define them as family. You know, Bob's like family to me, so I'm going to give him a, a login doing, as well. You're making the exact opposite fallacy by pointing and saying, well, you're the only subscriber, so you're the only one who can see it. And then and by that logic, then you can't have anyone over your house to watch it. Or if you can't, you can't let anybody look over your shoulder at the bus station. If you fall into that trap, you no, end up. No, that's, that, that's not what it means at all. There's, there Why is not? a reasonable definition of who's in your household. And we went, this is just covering ground we talked about last time. All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Greg, thanks, Greg. You're the best, Greg. <laughs> Uh, well, that is it for this episode of Frame Rate. Uh, we are going to do a spoiler zone for the season premiere of Breaking Bad. So if you do not want to be spoiled about Breaking Bad, stop watching Frame Rate or listening to Frame Rate right this second. And we'll actually play a little of the outro music, give you a little time to find that pause or stop button. I know somebody's running and screaming right now. Uh, you can find us live on Mondays, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, twit.tv, or it's live.twit.tv and on demand all the time, twit.tv slash fr. Email us, framerate at twit.tv. We'll see you next time. Silent Breed is people! So, did you watch Breaking Bad? Yeah. Did you watch Breaking Bad? Yeah. What'd you think? Did, did uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's that okay. was really good. I enjoyed hey, it. Did you uh, did you watch it? Uh, I assume you watched it like on AMC, right? Yeah, I did actually. I watched it on Directv, and I think last time I watched Breaking Bad, the la- you know the last time that the new issue or the new issues, uh, I do I I call comic books episodes and TV shows issues now. I'm just mixing it all up. The last time uh, the season it. was new. AMC was not in high def on DirecTV. So last night we were watching it. We're like, wow, this looks really good this season. We're like, oh, right. It wasn't high def last year. Wait a minute. Do you think, uh, wait, uh, I thought we discussed this because you remember at the end of the, this major spoilers, if you're not caught up, uh, but but when Gus Fring's face was all blowed off and uh, I said it looked cartoonish and I didn't like it, I was watching it in, in HD. You said it to, you totally believed it. Were, were you watching it in standard definition? Could that that might have been it. That might have been it. Yeah. yeah. I so, didn't think uh, about that. Uh, hmm. yo, no, I, I, mean, I think it's great. Uh, here's the one thing I did notice, and this doesn't have anything to do with the show. Oh, man, did AMC really want you to watch their knockoff of, uh, of Reno 911. Uh, th- oh, it was like, putting the previews in the first commercial break? By the way, two. it didn't work, AMC. I put it on pause, and I fast-forwarded. I did watch a few of your commercials. If that's what you're looking for, I guess that's all you care about, but... <laughs> That just annoyed me. They also me. showed uh, the the, the four-minute uh, trailer for the next season of The Walking Dead, oh, which we didn't even talk about in this in this episode. Um, d- did you see the four-minute uh, Yeah, season? yeah. No, it looks really good. Um, I'm excited to see Michonne is, is used so much uh, to see her more. And, and I'm okay with that, saying, oh, we're going to give you a sneak peek at The Walking Dead in the next episode of whatever. That's fine. But... The previews are like they've become a right for for the viewer, haven't they? Does well, common law apply here somehow? Think about the people who DVR'd it though, who like literally that's all they get to see is like for scenes. Oh, right, because it wouldn't have recorded the next. Yeah, yeah, no, that's- exactly. But uh, but I'll tell you this much: uh, I think the heart of the show is alive and well. Uh, and this is going to be so petty of me, and just f- forgive me personally, Tom, for being this guy. But I've I've never been more sad that I watched Mythbusters than during this episode because it was it, it was that business with the magnet. You know, when the Mythbusters essentially showed that using that method wouldn't even demagnetize a credit card, much less a, a shielded hard drive and a laptop. I understand. I, I understand it's a movie. I understand it's a TV show. I understand that people get stuff wrong all the time. So the wait, in that, Mythbusters, did they use the big, powerful coil magnets like that in that the test? They used, they used extremely powerful magnets, and I don't know if it's you know exactly that size or whatever, but, but the point was what they discovered was on credit cards, if they set it down, they could blast it with incredible amounts of magnetism, and it would still be fine. The only way it would... It would mess up as if they moved it around or if they had alternating current on there, which is why you have things like degaussers, which are intentionally which different. Which they devices. obviously had alternating current on this large magnet. 
No, they clearly had direct current with all the batteries that are from cars that were on this thing. But no, they, but yeah. they had set up altered day. I, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and here's the thing is for a show like Breaking Bad that has done so well with the science side of things, it would have taken so little for them to just write a MacGuffin in there to just say, you know, well, that wouldn't work. But I'll tell you what would work is if you used it in this pattern, make up some pattern that would make it work or something. Just address my concern and make it okay. And it was, uh, but that, that really, that really stuck at me. But outside of that, everything was great. And you I know loved, what bothered just, me about the episode? This is also huh. petty. Just, you know, this is really like humble brag petty. Uh, I actually got to go to the Breaking Bad panel at Comic-Con. Yeah. And they showed us that scene in the desert twice where Mike and, and, and uh, Pinkman all drive up. And yep. when, it, when it actually happened in the show, I was like, <sighs> bored. You know, I, I know I know what's going to, yeah, okay, you say, oh, you point the gun. Okay, where, where are we going with this? Where are we going? That is that is kind of a good. It was hor- it, and it's, it's like horribly douchey to be complaining about that, but and I and I wouldn't. But it was it, it is kind of the. It's like yeah, I want to see the teaser stuff ahead of time, but at the same time, when you see it out of context, it kind of disrupts the flow when you're watching because something yeah, suddenly sure. becomes very familiar. Uh, what, well, uh, the important thing is I'm definitely all in on this season. I'm excited to see how things turn up. Uh, it's um, is it just me or did Skylar get even more plastic surgery? She gets younger every season. No, I did not notice that at all. No. I, I Okay. Well, somebody else can back me up on that because, like, every time she, her skin is smoother and more Lustrous. Tight. Maybe she's just eating well. Sure. I'm sure that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I thought it was a great episode. Uh, and uh, one of the things they talked about at the Comic-Con panel is the transformation of Walt uh, and taking a, an incredibly sympathetic character. I mean, the guy's got cancer. Uh, yep. He's a teacher, one of the most you know underpaid and usually vaunted professions in the country, and they, you are beginning to hate him. Well, or or at least fear him, and certainly not understand him. And and in many ways, and I know you haven't seen the Shield, but to anyone at home who has, I've I've for years now been saying that. Uh, Breaking Bad is the exact inverse of The Shield. The Shield starts out with a character who from episode one is absolutely damned. You hate him. You don't understand him. You know he needs to go to jail or die or something. And instead, over five, six, seven seasons, uh, you just you you start to understand and it pains you to see this noose tightening around him, even though you wanted it to happen at the beginning. And on Breaking Bad, we're seeing the exact opposite. We're seeing somebody who uh, somebody who you love and trust at the beginning, who's a fish out of water, in out of his depth, and now you see him just darkening and darkening to where now you 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 don't even understand it, but you kind of want him to keep going. And Jesse look- Pinkman is the one who used to be kind of reprehensible and 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 sort of like, ugh, kind of hate this guy a little bit, uh, and now he's become like, oh, Je- Jesse's the reasonable one. He's you know he'll he'll protect Walt from from Mike and settle everything down and be the mediator. It's just, uh, one of the things I, I don't remember if we've talked about this before, uh, but they said that Jesse was actually scheduled to be killed in season one. Oh, I I did hear about that. Uh, I forget where, but uh, but I wonder what did they say in the panel? What the justification was to keep him around? They just enjoyed the character so much after the, writing it all season that they decided to find a way for him to escape uh, That's awesome. death, and they're like even up to the point where we had Hank knocking at the door, uh, we didn't know how we were going to save Jesse in oh, season awesome. one. We just, and, and we, we rode our way out of it and, and came up with something uh, to save him. But he, he was not supposed to, to be there. And now he's become beloved. And of course, immediately when they're talking about this, uh, Brian Cranston says, it's not too late. <laughs> uh oh did did you was i the only one who the moment i saw him having uh having breakfast and and uh, the, when they set it out i immediately thought that's real bacon not veggie bacon and then and then he grabbed it and broke it in broke half it? And yeah it's it just like it's gonna be 51 but instead it was 52 which of course uh, yeah. is because it shows that that's the foreshadowing that takes place um think about like the baby holly would be like a year and a half years old by then and he's still taking the pills but what kind of pills? Well, and he's got he's got the cough back yep. again, and he's just uh, really I'm I'm excited about what they're what they're indicating. Well, and what's really interesting is that this has been a thing for them is to start a season with a flash forward that you really don't know where it's going, and and be just so confused like the eyeball uh, of the of the stuffed animal 
and, yep. and, and this year it's not subtle. I mean, we did, we're not like trying to figure out, oh, is that an eyeball? Was that an eye? It's like, oh, that's a big ass gun in that right. truck. But you still oh, no. don't know where it's going. He's definitely hell bent. Well, and he's clearly, you know, they also dropped other things like the fact that he's been in New Hampshire for a long time and that. Uh, Has he, though? That could just be a back. lie. Well, no, yeah, it, it could be. But I think I think that makes sense for the story. It's yeah, like maybe. I'm interpreting. I mean, or that that's clearly what we're meant to think. I mean, and we are like, supposed to get a lot more of the Germans. We saw I saw that in the preview. We didn't see it in the in episode one, but uh, the the German company that was backing Gus Fring. We're we're supposedly going to see a lot of Germans this season. I thought you meant like the Germans from the Big Lebowski, and I was way confused. <laughs> we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of the Germans this year. <laughs> Awesome, man. Well, I'm excited that you're excited. This will be a good season. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thanks, everybody, for enjoying the spoiler zone. Uh, hopefully we didn't accidentally spoil anyone, but just enhanced your viewing pleasure.